Hello, welcome to Eat Sleep Code, the official Teller podcast. I'm your host, Ed Charbonneau, and with me today is a good friend of mine, Guy Royce. How you doing, Guy? I'm doing fantastic. How you doing, Ed? Oh, I am doing good. Uh, it is very nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a busy week. I'm, I'm getting ready for a conference. I know you're probably uh, working on some conferences as well, but I have Dev Up coming next week. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, one of those situations where they picked a talk that I haven't quite written the content for yet. And I just realized that this a week away from the show. So I'm scrambling to get some some materials together. But other than that, of, <laughs> I'm kind of in the same boat, actually. <laughs> uh, I'm speaking at DevOps Poland in a couple of weeks and uh, I'm doing a talk that um, I'm I've been working on the code for on stream, but I don't have any slides yet. And so. Mm. Uh, I, I should have run my code at the uh, JavaScript group here in Columbus yesterday, uh, but I haven't actually uh, built a single slide yet. <laughs> so I know your pain. Yes, we, we've done some traveling and things together. So uh, we've crossed paths quite a few times and um, we know each other quite well. So I figured, you know, just by happen chance, you, you might be in the same boat that I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was correct. <laughs> <laughs> the, the real question is, is, are we ever going to get out of that boat? <laughs> yeah, I kind of did for, for about two years while we were all stuck at home and we couldn't go to conferences, but we're, we're back traveling again. And yeah. now I'm trying to get used Good. to it again. Uh, so today's show guy is going to be about you and, and what you do. So why don't you give us a little rundown of, uh, what you've been up to. So, um, well, well, uh, you know, for for introductions, you might notice that I got a shirt here that says Redis Labs on it. We're not Redis Labs anymore; we're just Redis. Uh, but uh, I, my T-shirt uh, needs upgraded. Uh, it's uh, it's you know, I need to uh, do an npm upgrade on it to uh, get, get a new <laughs> shirt. Um, but uh, I work for Redis as a developer advocate, and so I'm doing all kinds of stuff with the Redis. Um, the big thing I've been working on right now is um, using Redis as a, I've been. I'm working on this really fun kind of ridiculous project uh, where I uh, am tracking aircraft using software defined radio and Redis. And so um, I've got these, uh, these, uh, well, let me pull it out here. I can show it on, on screen for those who are not listening. You will be able to see what this thing looks like as I unscrew it and unplug it from my computer. I've got one of these things here. It's a uh, $25 dongle that I bought on Amazon. That's a radio on one end. So it looks a like USB a, on the other end. It looks like a rather large USB drive with yeah. a uh, coax cable stuck on one end. Yeah, and it's a little tiny uh, uh, SMA coax, like the back on the back of a network card. And mm -hmm. so what this thing does is it picks up radio frequencies from like zero megahertz all the way up to 2000 megahertz. And uh, one of the things you can pick up, in addition to like cam radio, people talking and shortwave radio broadcasts and and just regular terrestrial radio, like you know, FM radio stations that play wonderful, wonderful rock and roll. Um, there's data formats out there. And one of those is aircraft transponder broadcasts. So all the aircraft mm -hmm. broadcast their location from their transponder. And you can pick this up, decode it. And so I've been picking it up, decoding it, and pushing the data into Redis using uh, Redis streams and using a streaming architecture. And then I take that, the streams from multiple of these receivers that my team has across the uh, globe. Got one in Oakland, one in Nottingham, and one here in Columbus, Ohio. And then you know take that streaming data and aggregate it into other streams, and then feed that into like a consumer that creates documents using uh, JSON documents in Redis, and then putting them on a map so you can visualize the ones that are around you. And it's been a really mm -hmm. fun project. Um, and I, I think it's honestly going to make a really awesome demo in person uh, because. I can literally hook this up, put an antenna on the podium and say, Hey, let's look at all the aircraft that are around us right now. <laughs> in yeah, real that's time. One thing that always shocked me when I was doing electronics in, in college, I, uh, I built a radio and when you build your radio, one of the first things you have to do is tune the radio to the tuner. So, you know, when you tune the range, you actually get radio stations. And I started picking up air traffic, and yeah. I was like, oh, this is actually just broadcast with no encryption on rad regular radio channels. And you could hear like the conversations between the pilot and the tower and everything yeah. else. I was pretty surprised at that. I assume you were building an FM radio, not an AM yes. radio. 
Yeah, because yeah, the because the frequencies for the, the the frequencies for all the uh, pilot to tower communications, I believe, are in the two meter band around like I think it's around 140 megahertz. And so, if you're building an FM radio, it would be just a little bit north of like you know 107.9 power FM. You know. <laughs> But it's up, up, up somewhere between FM broadcast and uh, like weather radios, which I think are in the 160 megahertz range, which yeah, you can so also actually, pick up with these things. So. I actually still have it. Um, oh, cool. It's, it's a nice little backdrop item. So it's it was sitting at the back of my uh, my window or way, my, you know, studio here. But uh, yeah, when we were tuning this guy in, um, I'm trying to remember where the thing is. There's some coils. Oh, up here at the top that you had to manually adjust by yeah. tweaking those things. Um, the gap between those coils will change the impedance and the, kind of affect the overall range of the radio and what it can pick up. And yeah, you're, uh, yeah, you're using it as a filter to filter out the, all, all the frequencies in a yeah. sort of a curve, right? And, you know, it's not mm -hmm. flat. It's not like yeah. a narrow filter. It's, it's a curve. And so you want to... Yeah. You wanted to optimize that coil so that it picks up FM broadcast terrestrial radio stuff, but other stuff is in that range. So, yeah. So, so we're here. We're hearing the, the air it's traffic, so cool. and I was like, "It is cool," but I was like, "Man, there, there's like zero encryption on this. Like, it it's literally yeah. sent uh, just like regular you know, radio would be." Well, it's it's a conscious decision uh, on the part of those those standards bodies, uh, the, the transponder data from aircraft is also broadcast in the clear. It's more important that everyone know where all the airplanes are so that they don't fly into each other, which is a much mm -hmm. more likely occurrence than any security risk that you get from having that data be public. That makes sense. Yeah. And so that's, that's the decision that was made. Uh, it's worth noting that military aircraft also have transponders, but they have a little switch to turn them off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they, they, they don't necessarily want, it's like, Oh, there they are. <laughs> Um, and we, I would, we also actually, wouldn't be surprised. At, I don't know um, this, but if the military has uh, transponder spoofing as well, wh where you could broadcast false coordinates about your location, that, that seems like something that you would do during warfare. So, yeah, um, we, we've got live chat here as well, uh, which is something new to the the uh, podcast. Um, so we're streaming live on Twitch, and uh, somebody says uh, fine modulation. I think it's. I don't know if this is a joke or misunderstanding, it, but it's frequency. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as my as my electronics teacher used to call it, effing magic. Yeah. <laughs> and there's also the PFM, right? Yeah. <laughs> how certain software packages work. They're pure magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you, so you took electronics as well? I, I took electronics in high school. Um, yeah, I, I have a degree school. in electronics engineering. Um, okay, so you know way more than I do. <laughs> I turned out to uh, not like it very much. Yeah, I I actually liked. Uh, you, you know, when you're in high school, you got that choice, and you can go to the vocational school, or you can go mm -hmm. to like junior. You do your junior, senior year at regular high school and take more Latin. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, which which honestly I would have done if I hadn't gone to the vocational school. Uh, or you could go and one like auto body or welding or uh, or electronics. So I went and studied mm -hmm. electronics because I thought it was interesting. And so it's just a weird, it actually means that I never took high school calculus, but I learned a bunch of electronics. And so to this day, I oh, still don't know Electronics calculus. is full of mathematics though. So I'm sure you, you learned plenty. I learned the math um, I needed to do to like, I learned the trigonometry to figure out the impedance of, you know, yes. AC circuits with coils and in them and that kind of stuff. But that, you know, just the math that I needed to know to do specific things. So, yeah, I remember I was, uh, you know, this stuff always comes back and, and you end up using it somewhere. And like my daughter comes home one day and she is like, uh, she's like, yeah, we just learn like something with graphs and like angles and, and, uh, you know, calculating the, the distance between two points in the graph. And she's like, when am I ever going to use this again? And I was like, I just used that this morning because somebody asked me if, um, I could do swipe gestures <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> basically gives you two points on, on the face of your screen. And then you calculate the velocity between those two points that tell if they're swiping left or right. And she just looked at me like, 
why did you have to answer that? <laughs> like, it's, you know, she wanted the, you'll never, you'll never use this in your entire life answer. And I gave her yeah. like actual legitimate use off the top of my head that I just used that morning. And she's just like, <sighs> that, that said, that is, I, I think that probably is rather, well, my experience has been that that's rather exceptional. And the vast majority of the math that I, I do as part of my career as a software developer has been basic algebra. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but there are there are noted exceptions and when you start getting in the machine learning space the math starts mat mattering a whole lot more yeah and uh yeah, some so. statistics uh honestly uh having a background in that would have been more useful both for machine learning and uh, you know just other things in general and and so. as i figured uh with with you and i in the same room we get like way off track and topic <laughs> down every rabbit hole imaginable immediately it's i like, tweeted uh, that very thing yeah <laughs> When we're like 10 minutes in, we've already jumped from what was supposed to be the topic to now uh, trigonometry, airplanes, yeah. and whatever else. So a uh, little, little bit back on topic. Uh, what exactly is Redis for folks listening that don't know what Redis is? So I'll give the uh, the one sentence answer to that question, and I'll, I'll give a, a little more of an um, involved answer. Um, Redis is a memory-first uh, NoSQL database. Uh, now, lots of people are saying that's not true. Redis is a cache. Well, it turns out in-memory databases make fantastic caches. And so Redis is a fantastic cache as well. And a lot of people use uh, Redis primarily as a cache because it's really good at it. And uh, it's free and available and open source. And so, hey, I need to make my other database faster. Uh, I'll put Redis in front of it and cache frequently access content. Or I'll store my session data uh, for my web users in Redis. So th those are all very common use cases for Redis. Um, but, uh, it's, it's, um, it's really, um, that, uh, memory first or an in-memory NoSQL database. Um, but, but more specifically, I think of it as, uh, networked memory or maybe, um, oh, uh, you know, all those data structures you learned about in college, assuming you took a computer science, uh, uh, degree and didn't take say electrical engineering or, uh, went to a, DeVry like I did. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about everyone else. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm guessing, Ed, based on your uh, educational background, you probably didn't take a data structures class in college. No, not, but, no but, I didn't take any CS, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and yet here we are, right? <laughs> yeah. So we uh, kind of did the opposite. I took the CS in high school and went to, to school for electronics. And you took kind of the other path, I think. Yeah. I actually have what they called a computer information systems degree. And so it was, it was like, you know how there's the MIS degree that you can get, which is basically uh, a business degree with some programming. And then there's like mm -hmm. the computer science degree, which is actual computer science. The mm -hmm. degree I got is halfway between those two. And so okay. it was more programming heavy with a little bit of business, but didn't go into the deep theory of, of software. It was more gotcha. just how to write code. It was a little more pragmatic in, in some ways. Although the theory is super helpful when, the technology changes out from underneath you repeatedly. Anyhow, <laughs> so when you took computer science, you learned all about all these data structures, uh, hash tables and sets and linked lists and all these sorts of things. Redis is all of those data structures with a wire protocol in front of them. And so uh, that wire protocol lets you issue commands to say set or get the value of just a block of memory. We call them strings, but they could be clobs or blobs, doesn't matter. They're arbitrarily mm -hmm. large binary or non-binary data structures. Uh, you can set uh, fields within a hash table. Uh, and these are all stored in keys in Redis. And so um, you, we've got sets uh, for, you know, it's like sets like in a mathematical sense. You can add things to a set, check it for membership, do unions between sets, do intersections between sets. Um, there's uh, lists, which are doubly linked lists that you can push and pop to. Uh, there's a whole host of uh, data structures that are served up, and so that's that's what Redis is. It's a data it's a data structure server. It's all those data structures okay. with a wire protocol in front of them. So this is what you're using to track the airplane data. Yeah, I'm actually. So so most people uh, internally sometimes we we ask how what's everyone think of uh, think Redis is and how are they using it when you go, go out to the conferences to talk to people. And the most common mm -hmm. response is Redis is a cache. It has get and set. And so they're just setting and they'll use set and they'll like set a big JSON object and then they'll get it and then they'll deserialize it and then use it. And that's a real mm -hmm. common scenario. 
Uh, but Redis actually has a, a plethora of uh, of uh, data types in it, and one of those types is a uh, stream, a streaming event stream. Um, uh, you know, you, you might know that from uh, other applications like Kafka, <laughs> that sort of data structure. So Redis has one of those built in, uh, in the open source version of Redis. And so what I'm doing in my particular problem is I'm using the software defined radio to get transponder data from the aircraft. Um, and each of those messages that I receive is an event. And it might have information about that aircraft, like its latitude and longitude. It might mm -hmm. have information about its uh, velocity. Mm -hmm or it's heading or, you know, it's call sign, you know, this is Delta flight 33 from New York to LA. Mm -hmm. I think that's the flight from New York to LA. Um, we'll, we'll go with Delta flight two from Detroit to Heathrow. Cause I, I was on that one recently. Um, Does it follow a uh, specific schema? This, this flight information? Yeah, it's actually an international standard. Okay. And so it's, it's this real dense hex data. I mean, it's just binary data, but uh, you can get it as, as hexadecimal code. Uh, but the software I'm using to uh, pick it up is called Dump 1090. And it's called Dump 1090 because uh, 1090 is the megahertz frequency for all the transponders in international. Oh, okay. And so Dump 1090 just dumps all the messages from uh, 1090 megahertz that it receives. Um, and that software, which uh, coincidentally, uh, this. When I was exploring this, I thought that was really funny. The guy who created the original version of Dump 1090 is Salvatore Sanfilippo, who's the guy who wrote Redis. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was just a wonderful what coincidence. coincidence. Um, I mean, it makes a great story now, right? You know, it's like, oh, look, look, I'm going to use Redis written by this guy. And then I'm going to use this other thing written by, oh, look, the same guy. Um, but it, it, uh, it receives those messages, decodes them, and then it sets up a socket server. Uh, that you can connect to to either get uh, CSV values in a particular format called SPS1 or to get the uh, the hex values uh, and you can parse them mm -hmm. out yourself. And um, the data in there is probably the, the, the most interesting piece of data that's in there. The latitude and longitude look really cool because you can plot them on a map and see where all the airplanes are. But the um, the uh, each airplane has a unique ID, like a, like a SSN for aircraft, but it's actually kind of more like a GUID for an aircraft. Because um, like UUIDs, they really, people aren't really using them this way anymore, but when they were originally created, you have the MAC address of your network card embedded in the GUID. And then you could use that as a signature to figure out what machine this GUID was generated by. And uh, the aircraft ID, part of that 24-bit uh, number includes the uh, country of registration. So you can actually look at that and figure out what country that aircraft is registered with. And so whether it's like from the UK or you know, uh, Bulgaria or whatever. Um, Very cool. And, and so I'm feeding all those events into a Redis stream. And then I'm, you know, once I've got streaming data, I can start consuming it and turning it into other data structures within Redis and then making it searchable and put, building front ends that read it. And then, boom, I've got data in a database and I can start doing things with that data. Yeah. This is one of the things that's difficult about presenting um topics on software development is coming up with the, an idea that's going to catch people's attention and keep them, uh, for lack of a better term, entertained for a half hour to an hour while you, yeah. you know, show them the technology. Uh, that's something you, you've been pretty good at, uh, guys, finding uh, topics that just entertain folks. And, and that's one of the reasons that uh, I think we run into each other so often at conferences You've got these talks that are being accepted everywhere because they're they're just downright interesting uh, to go watch you talk about them. It's it's really cool that you know you're able to do this and uh, come up with a you know a session on uh, teaching people about Redis, but while at the same time you know showing something off that's fun to you know learn about and watch. I think that's pretty cool. Where did you come up Thanks. with the idea? Is it just um, mm -hmm. Just tinkering you know, with something one day or? Well, you know, it all, I mean, this is sort of my pattern, right? And by the mm -hmm. way, thank you for noticing. Uh, <laughs> uh, I actually, all of my talks are basically introductions with fun themes. That's mm -hmm. that's that's what I do. Um, and it's it's not an easy thing. I mean, you summed it up very, you know, concisely, but it's it's very difficult to, to do what you're doing. So 
Well, the I, introduction part isn't that hard. I mean, writing in a talk that's an introduction to a topic is not the hard part. In some correct. Ways. I mean, it is and it isn't. Like, like yeah. if you're an expert in a thing and you want, it's like, okay, how do I just get to the part where I introduce the bits that, what parts are relevant, what aren't? That can be a little challenging. Yeah. yeah. Laying out information for a noob is, there. there is a an art to that. But mm -hmm. um, the ideas for these things just sort of, they just pop into my head, honestly. Uh, they, they, oftentimes they happen when I'm talking to someone. Like, you know, we'll be on, like, like we're doing right now. And, and mm -hmm. we'll start talking about, you know, you could do this. Hey, I found this cool tech. And oh, yeah, you could do that. It's like, you know what we could do, right? <laughs> and then boom, funny idea. And then we go like, like a coworker of mine has a talk that's going to be at Code Palooza, um, uh, Steve Lorello. And um, he lives in Florida. And um, and um, we were sort of joking at a, at a company at a team meeting and we said florida man uses cash as database <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, and so uh, we put it together as a talk i, I helped him write an abstract and uh, he's going to be presenting that at code palooza <laughs> nice so uh so some they just kind of pop into my head um this particular talk um i saw some youtube video about these software defined radio dongles and i'm like and they were cheap and you could use an inexpensive antenna and start listening to ham radio broadcasts. Just listen to people talking and stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm like, that sounds really cool. And so I got one and then I played with it for a few evenings and got it working. And then I'm like, oh, I need a better antenna. So I went and bought a better antenna. And uh, it's kind of a fiddly world. Like a lot of the software is written by hobbyists uh, who are real technical. And so they have the user interfaces you would expect of someone who is like super in the weeds technical. Uh, which is to say that they don't have a user interface. They <laughs> they just have a yeah. bunch of buttons on a screen, <laughs> um, and uh, and and the, the the hardware they're interacting with is it's kind of I guess fringe would be the right word, or it's kind of an edge case. It's just not mainstream, and yeah, so it's a little that, bit of a niche item. Yeah, niche. That's a good word. Um, um, Although honestly, some of the stuff you hear on uh, on uh, ham radio is kind of fringe too, so that's that's entertaining. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> but I've got um, some stories. But so you know, I start playing with it, start listening to it, and then I'm like, oh, there's these data formats. How do I start interacting with those? And I'm watching YouTube videos and just sort of exploring the topic. And I it occurred to me that um, the aircraft data that I was looking at was a natural fit for streams. I mean, it's just it's literally events this aircraft sent a message, this aircraft sent a message and it's events mm -hmm. with data in them. I'm like, this is just a perfect fit for a streaming data structure. And so I quickly uh, I built like seven lines of code and I was able to shove that data into Redis. Uh, there's wow. practically nothing to it because that, that format that um, that SBS one format that the dump 1090 software spits out is a standard. And someone wrote a node library that knows how to connect to a socket server over TCP and read that standard and give you nice, neat JavaScript objects. And Very then cool. Redis streams, when you write to Redis streams, uh, you just give it a JavaScript object. And so it was pretty much read, write, read, write, read, write, and you're done. And so I was able to populate a stream immediately. And so I'm like, the proof of concept achieved. Okay, let's build something bigger around this and build a talk. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew it would be, as soon as you, I, I was excited about the tech. And usually if I'm excited about the tech, someone else is going to be excited about the tech. And so I knew it yeah. would make a really cool demo. Uh, because anytime you do a demo, if the, the audience can touch it somehow, or if it has something to do with where you're at, it's so much more compelling. Um, Definitely. And so this is, hey, here's all the aircraft that are around us right now. Um, that's a compelling demo because it's real. It's not, it's not vaporware. It's, it's actually what's around us. And so, um, but yeah, these ideas just sort of pop into my head when I have conversations, stuff like that. It, I, yeah, it's <laughs> the reason where, I brought it up. It's, where do ideas uh, come from anyhow? Right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's difficult. Like, uh, I mean, I've, I've been doing, uh, conferences for roughly 10 years and, um, one of the things I, I noticed uh, helping run a conference, especially I noticed this uh, when something new comes out, um, say there's a new framework that comes out. JavaScript's got one like mm -hmm. every week. Um, every uh, everybody submits these like sessions like uh, getting started with. And literally, that's the title of like 
nine out of ten yeah like topics that you get uh when you're running a conference like you'll you'll get a you know it, depending on how big the conference is i think uh the one i was helping with we would get i want to say like 500 you know sessions submitted and when something new comes out you get like at least like a hundred of them is like how to get started with and it's like yeah, how you know you need to stand out a little bit when you yeah. come up with these things and uh, after, you know, you're doing speaker selections and, and session selections and you see the same title almost verbatim, you know, a dozen times, yeah. you're like, OK, I need to pick something that's got the same abstract, maybe, but has a different spin on how to present this material. And it's not an easy thing to come up with. It's like I could do a, I could select this talk on graph databases or I could select the talk on graph databases that has a Dungeons and Dragons theme. <laughs> right right yeah yeah so uh I, I meant to say to everyone in the audience that's uh, uh submitting to conferences that this idea totally doesn't work and you shouldn't do it and uh that i don't want any competition no. <laughs> <laughs> um i i don't think competition is going to be an easy thing because yeah. uh what you're doing is, is quite difficult and and you've been um you've been able to do it you know repeated uh, success so congratulations to you on that thanks uh you've got quite a few um like workshops and talks and things that are are very entertaining so this is yet another one uh so you have you had one on on bigfoot before that was always fun to talk about yeah uh, i do have a kid <laughs> did, did we do a podcast on that one in particular i think we may have uh, well I, i've had two bigfoot theme things uh, mm -hmm. uh when i was at data robot i did a bigfoot themed uh uh uh, natural language classifier so you could type in like you know your bigfoot sighting and it would tell you whether it yeah. was a class a class b or class c bigfoot sighting and uh and more recently I, i've been doing a bigfoot theme talk uh called finding bigfoot with redis and redis search where um, oh, nice uh where i take all this the same bigfoot data that i used to train the model uh i instead have added it to a redis database and then as uh, json documents actually using redis json and then I use Redis search to then search it. And so you can go in and search for Bigfoot in all the myriad ways that you might want to find him, whether, um, you know, it's, it's by what state it happened in or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, near Cincinnati or whether it's, uh, has the word Creek in it. I, I guess I should say Crick, honestly, since we're talking <laughs> about Bigfoot sightings in, in West Virginia yeah. and Kentucky and Ohio. <laughs> so, um, and so you know, maybe, but maybe yeah, there's enough fun. You need a double dip there. You could get, uh, you know, he, of course you work at Redis, but you could also go for a sponsorship with Yeti. Oh I mean, yeah, there we go. That's a good that'd, idea. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the, uh, uh, I'm the abdominal snowman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, man. Part of it, part of the joy of the, of the Bigfoot theme stuff is, is sort of the absurdity of it in a way there, there's a, a, a fun, <laughs> there's a playfulness to it. And some of the stories are delightful uh, when you read through them. And so you can pick up something and like uh, one of my favorite gags to do when I'm talking, doing the Bigfoot talk is uh, once I get the, the, all the sightings loaded is I'll do a keyword search for, give me all the Bigfoot sightings that have the word Walmart in them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, there's like four or five of them in the data set, which it's, it's just kind of funny. Um, there's only one that has the word Amish in it though. And it happened in Indiana. And I was happened to be in Indiana when I discovered that it happened in Indiana, given a talk, given this talk. So it was the audience thought that was particularly funny. <laughs> Did they happen to see you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, but there's, there's um, like I've done UFO theme things and I've done Bigfoot theme things and I'll do Dungeons and Dragons theme things. And um, I just take stuff that I think is kind of fun and try and, mm -hmm. uh, combine it with technology um, or take, take a, a common scenario and turn it into something that's just a little more fun. Like uh, fun is probably the key word that I put in to all of the talks that I'm trying to put together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I try to do similar stuff. Uh, it's probably one of the reasons we get along so good. Like uh, I, I was doing some machine learning stuff in the, the obligatory, like machine learning, uh, project the the uh, uh Mnist, call the to do list the to do list of of machine learning one of those is the taxi uh 
the the tax you yeah. rate calculations or predictions. Yeah. Um, and, th- and that seemed kind of boring. So I took uh, the taxi thing and I was like, well, what if we just abstract this to I want to go from Earth to Mars instead of point A in Manhattan to point B in Manhattan yeah. <laughs> and uh, just kind of fudge the, the numbers with some zeros. Uh, after the predictions were done and it's like it it turned out to be pretty interesting because it's like i want to fly to you know from earth to to the moon it's going to cost me this much money if i want to go from moon to mars it's going to be this much and it was like it was something like you know 38 dollars to get from one end of manhattan to the other but if you're talking like the you know going to mars i just threw like three zeros on the end of that or something's like, well, it's $38,000. Yeah. But it made the talk more fun. Yeah. It was definitely a bargain, but it made the talk more interesting, you know, with space visuals and, you know, um, some cool CSS and things like that. in the, the visual part of it, and it kind of grabs people's attention a little bit better than we're going to take a taxi. (laughs) So it's, yeah, some of these things are a reach sometimes, but, uh, it's still, it's, it's fun. You know, it's not supposed to be, you know, it's serious. Like you said, it's a bargain. Yeah. It's definitely not yeah. real data <laughs> or it, it's real data, but it's definitely not real to the scenario. Let's say. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just that fun. And, and mm-hmm. the challenge sometimes is, is like, so that there's technical topics that I think it'd be interesting to do talks on, but it's hard to find a theme. And so uh, mm-hmm. I tend to just wait for inspiration <clears throat> uh, from just I'm consuming random media and just however inspiration works. Right. You know, does anyone really know how that works? Uh, it just sort of, you know, these ideas come unbidden into your mind and then you're like, that's a good one. I'm going to keep that one. And, <laughs> and, and then that's really the process. I, I know that's like not helpful at all for anyone else that's trying to do these things, but <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that's how all your thoughts kind of work is they just pop into your head and it's like, oh, where'd that come from? Well, I don't know, but I've got it now. Um, and have you ever swung too far for the fences and come up with something that's so abstract that people don't choose it? Um, I've had some this, talks that this has happened been, to me. <laughs> yeah. Where, where I've, um, um, now I'm trying, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think back to some of the talks I did when I was in in a previous role. And there were a couple that just didn't land. Um, yeah. uh, I've had some where I didn't actually have a fun theme. Like I, I had a really popular talk on WebAssembly. It was called an introduction to WebAssembly. I actually did the thing that we were just making fun of earlier. And um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we weren't making fun of it, but you know what I mean? Um, I, I publicly shamed you is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, it actually got picked up by a lot of places. Um, Mm -hmm. And I was kind of surprised by it that it did. I I didn't put a lot of effort into the abstract, Uh, but I had, and and this is actually another formula, I think, is if you can identify up and coming technologies that have a a, a learning curve that's steep and you want to sort of sort out that learning for everyone else, Mm -hmm. um, there aren't, it's not very competitive in that field then. Right. So not, nobody was doing talks on WebAssembly, but everyone had heard the buzz around it. And so then yeah. I, I, you know, I put together this talk where I go all the way down to the bottom and talk about what WebAssembly is like at the bytecode level. And um, yeah, and she did so like I, a really deep dive then. That, those yeah. are always fun. And I actually anyway. live coded in the WebAssembly text format language. And so you could actually see the, the low level language and do something real with it. Um, but um, the, sort of the, I think the reason that talk was successful is because no one else was really talking about WebAssembly yet. Mm-hmm. And there's like this, there's a sweet spot where something's like, there's a curve, there's that hockey stick curve, right? And if you can get the talks like right at the elbow, then there, yeah. that's like that spot where everyone is learning about it, but no one has actually put together any content yet. And then you can, you can strike and, and get in that way as well. Um, and so, yeah, but I, I feel like I got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> with that, honestly, uh, it's, it's harder to do, right? I, I have one that I feel like I overreached on, and um, it's a talk about augmented reality, which still hasn't caught on as mainstream as I thought it would have by now. Yeah. But uh, this was quite some time ago, and uh, the the underlying theme of it is the Twilight Zone. 
and um, I, I learned some very interesting things from the audience doing that. Uh, one is um, people of a certain age know the Twilight Zone. Others do not. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on where this uh, conference took place and what the audience was like, people were completely baffled as to what the Twilight Zone even was. So um, it didn't always didn't always hit the right notes with people. Uh, it, it it also had a certain cringe factor to it that I th think was it was intentional on my part, but not everybody else enjoyed as much as I did. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that that one it's so much fun to to give that talk. It's a bit outdated now, so I don't submit it anymore. But it rarely got picked up. Yeah. Um, when it did, I got really good feedback on it, but it was hard to get like. It's really just hard to get it into conferences. They didn't know where to put it. So I think I, I went a little bit too fun, maybe. Uh, they were just like, I don't know what bucket this fits in, so we're not going to pick it. I've had, well, I, I've been on the selection committees of conferences as well, and I've made that mistake too, where I submit a talk and it doesn't fit neatly into a category. Mm -hmm. And they've got their tracks. And yeah. you put it in the track you think is the best fit, but then the person who's evaluating it, and I've been that person as well, says this doesn't really fit in this track. And trying to, and I've got uh, 400 talks to review. And so I should probably do the work to put this in the track it belongs in, but no one's got the time to mess with it. And so it just gets buried. Um, and I mean, that's unfortunate, honestly, because there's probably been a lot of good talks that get buried that way. Um, but that's a thing that happens. All right. You know, and so if you've got something that is weird, um, I actually am kind of a fan of thinking that conferences should not be so focused on tracks for this reason, because yeah. you can, there can be some really good talks that are just kind of in an odd category, but that you would totally want at your conference and you miss those because of this phenomenon. Uh, so uh, I think having the tracks kind of gets in the way sometimes of just, let's just say our, our track is, we're a .NET conference, and so anything .NET or .NET adjacent, submit it, and then we'll see what categories we get. Yeah, I, I think like one of the better approach. one of the best places for this type of stuff was at uh, Code Mash After Dark, which was a nice yeah. concept. So that that was a little bit easier to get your session accepted to for one, but they were yeah. a little less uh, focused on tracks and things, and and I managed to do the session there, so that that was a good time. Um, yeah. but, but well, yes. here we are a couple developer advocates talking about, uh, we're talking shop. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why not? <laughs> yeah. I'm All sure, my coworkers uh, are going to be talking about Redis and here we are just talking about uh, how the conference uh, circuit works. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> Although I, mean, I right. feel like it's useful data. I mean, if you're out there watching right now or listening to this later and you're an aspiring, uh, uh speaker, then, you know, I, I feel like this is very relevant information for you. So. I think we got a little little meta on your um, your session that you give about Redis. So I think we're we're still in the ballpark. We're just yeah uh, yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're in the we're in the broadcasting booth of the ballpark is all. Uh, well, when I tweeted that we were doing this, I did say we are prone to wander. <laughs> so. Yeah, wand, wander we will. Yeah, uh, it, it's funny. Like I remember back, like we did the podcast is on on the stream some or not the stream, but the uh, SoundCloud channel somewhere very early on it was like one of uh, the first season uh, yeah. shows we did a podcast and I remember we had, we had like known each other in passing a few times, but never yeah. really sat down and talked. We're like, let's record a podcast. We sat for like two hours and talked to each other. And then I was like, so you ready to record that podcast? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> we, <laughs> we rambled for like two hours with no microphone queued up and then recorded yet another hour. That was uh, at uh, music city code. Wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. I, I remember uh, I had given that was back when I was doing uh, putting the D and D in TDD, um, and that was we talked about test driven development a lot, as, as I recall on that one. And I remember, <laughs> I remember uh, my co presenter was like, "And you didn't invite me." <laughs> I'm sorry, George. <laughs> so, oh, we got. I see some comments here. We have uh, yeah. TM KDK. Uh, we, we I think we've been ignoring those a little a little while. <laughs> um, that I, I actually did kind of want to point this out because you can, uh, yeah, with the software defined radio that I'm using, you can get, you can actually build antennas and get images from the NOAA's uh, weather satellites. 
like the oh, that's pretty remember, cool. remember the weather satellite images you'd see like in the 80s and 90s on tv mm -hmm. uh you can actually get real-time images of this from those satellites as they pass overhead which is i mean cool. no i'm too young to remember that i can't get away with any sort of lie like that uh, <laughs> uh because uh i too have watched the twilight zone yeah <laughs> so and then sean's saying howdy it's good to see y'all um it's good to see you too sean so what's yeah, the next soon. event we're going to be at together ed is um, it going to be code palooza uh, probably yeah code palooza would probably be it that's in august yeah so we'll be in louisville which is uh pretty close to my hometown it's yeah. what I, I i live in the woods no not in the woods but i live far out that's of where big the city yeah. live very you know in the uh rural areas here of uh louisville so when somebody's like where are you from i gravitate to louisville because it's the only thing close enough that somebody's gonna know where that is yeah so uh yeah the louisville's uh close to my my hometown here um and then sean says he's uh at dev up next week we'll see i'll see you there uh kcdc since he deliver and code palooza you're busy 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 you submitted busy, for all busy. the things see uh i'll be at kcdc yeah. and code palooza so um at both of those i'm doing a workshop as well which i need to put together yet uh which is uh beyond the cash with redis and node.js so okay i'll be uh it's just a uh node.js workshop I, I guess when you say it, you're not supposed to say JS uh, according to the style guide. It's just Node, but it's written Node.js. Mm. Um, but uh, I'm doing a, a hey, you know, here's how to use Redis from Node, and uh, I plan on talking through like the data structures that are available and and uh, some of the advanced things you can do and just get people started using Redis as a database. Yeah, so, judging from the name, it's able to use more than just caching. It, it is more than a cache. Yeah, you can actually persist things. Um, a common thing that you will hear people say is like, but it's in memory and so it's not safe. It's like, well, odds are good that other database you're using has probably got a lot of stuff cached in memory before it writes things to disk. And mm -hmm. then if it crashes, you would lose those things. So that's not that different. Um, the difference with Redis is that everything's in memory first. And so it gives you better performance. It's, it's like you've cached everything. Uh, but then you can configure in your Redis config file Hey, I want to save this every so many key changes or every so many seconds or every so many seconds and so many key changes. And so you actually have explicit control over how often you are persisting that data. Okay. You can configure it to persist everything as soon as it happens, but then it's not in memory anymore and it's, it slows it down. And so you're, you're, you're making a conscious trade off. Um, if you combine that with uh, replication, so, uh, you know, Hey, I've got, uh, uh, read replicas of my uh, my uh, primary database. Then um, then you've got an, a layer of defense against one of those nodes going down as well, because that data will be replicated to other nodes. And um, so it's as safe as anything else. But um, but yeah, so it's it, it makes a good database. It's sort of I, I think I said this earlier. Maybe I didn't. Um, if you're uh, using um, a database and you're putting Redis in front of it to make your database fast enough. Um, and you just, you're loading all your data from your database into Redis anyhow, then you kind of don't need the database behind it. You should just use <laughs> <Yeah>. Redis. <laughs> right. Like uh, look, an occasional question I'll get uh, is, um, you know, my, uh, my insert database okay. vendor database, uh, I want to track whenever the data in there changes so I can update Redis. Um, that sounds like Redis should just be your database. Like if you want to make sure that the data in Redis gets updated whenever the database changes, because everyone reads Redis and no one goes to the database or the database is just there for writes, then you could just write to Redis and you don't need that underlying database. And so that's a common, common thing that I run into. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, I mean, beyond the cash is one of our sort of, it's one of our marketing slogans, honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it's a good one. Um, because that is sort of people go to Redis as a cache first, and that's, that tends to be how they think of it. But it, it actually does do a lot more than that. It's more than just caching strings of data. It's more than session management. I mean, my aircraft talk is using uh, streaming data structures in Redis. Um, Redis has pub subs, so you can do asynchronous. You can do messaging between nodes. So 
so I'm going to connect and subscribe to events. Uh, you can cluster it. Uh, you can add modules to it. Uh, they're like plugins to extend Redis. Uh, I'm using some of those. Uh, one's Redis JSON, which uh, lets you uh, add JSON data types and message uh, commands to manipulate those JSON data types to Redis. Um, we got Redis Search, which allows you to search for things in Redis as opposed to just having to get it by key. So it's actually, um, it's it does all the things that you need a database to do. It stores stuff, uh, searches stuff. It um, is extensible. You can put your own types in there. It's uh, it's actually kind of cool. I mean, I'm biased. I work there, of course, but uh, <laughs> even if I didn't work there, it's still kind of, it's still a pretty compelling piece of tech. Uh, and I, it's nice to have a gig where I can talk about the thing, my company's product uh, and be excited about it, be legitimately excited about it. Like if I yeah. couldn't be legitimately excited about it, it, well, this podcast would be very boring. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so while I am biased, I actually do think it's a good thing as well. Yeah, it's, it's always nice to work for a company uh, that you enjoy working with the product. Uh, that's that's one of the things that drew me to where I am. It's like I, I already used it, you know, I work for progress on the Telerik tooling. And it's like I was writing apps with Telerik before I joined the company. So it's yeah. it's not like I, I didn't enjoy using the product or something. It's It was a natural fit. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm already doing this you know, at work, and then you're telling me I can just go work on the tools that I'm using anyway? Sure. <laughs> Not only am I the president, I'm a customer too. <laughs> yeah, I'm also a client. It's like I'm a hair a club client. for men commercial. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which uh, is, again, uh, kind of like making references to the Twilight Zone, right? <laughs> yeah. That, I Every time somebody says that they don't know what that show is, it hurts my heart a little. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, so he, uh, here's the dividing line, I think. Uh, the, it's the, are you in the junior high category or the middle school category? So when I when I gave this talk, I would, um, if I saw, you know, you learn to read a room yeah. uh, when you do what we do. And uh, when I saw kind of those blank stares, when I started talking about the Twilight Zone, I would yeah. be like, all right, if, have you seen the Twilight Zone before? You know, quick raise of hands. And if you saw like a dwindling number of hands, I would say, uh, how about Black Mirror? And then like usually it would be the opposite, you know, of the <laughs> hands that were raised. And then then you could gauge like the the audience in, um, you know, if they were. You, you should have like two presentations ready to go and then like to <laughs> ask, ask, ask the question. <laughs> yeah. So I would always kind of switch gears a little bit and just say, you know, well, it's kind of like the predecessor to that show. You know, this they're the same same concept, but for a different generation. So, yeah. um, you know, I'd kind of give them the quick rundown of, of what it was. And then I'd say, and it's on Netflix and you have homework. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that, that Twilight Zone movie that came out in the eighties. Uh, yeah, there was also a, a re, um, a rerun, not rerun, but, a uh, what do you call those reboot of it yeah. in the nineties? Um, I guess it wasn't as popular then, but, uh, believe it or not, like corn made the, the intro music really? for it. Yeah. That Which makes still sense. the I mean, same. It was the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still the same like tune kind of. And I think the original, um, the original one was who, um, the soundtrack It's like another, oh. like very popular the, band. The, the original twilight zone. Yeah, like the old black and white one. Oh, I have no idea. I never really thought about. I'm trying to remember, music. there's been a couple. It's it's always been a uh, kind of a theme with the show. Um, gosh, I'm gonna have to Google it now. It's it's gonna drive me nuts. But it, yeah, Quit like corn did. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, Chris, I see your chat message. Uh, Ed, you're making uh, um, me feel old. Um, yeah yeah i'm making me feel old too uh, I, I and i'm probably older than both of you so <laughs> i'm officially middle-aged so okay so the original one was uh by the the person that did uh, his name is bernard herman he did uh stuff for scores for alfred hitchcock ah, okay um 
And then there was another one that was an update. I think it was the movie one, possibly. That was a popular band also. It was like The Who or like something like that. The Let's see. That. It's, it's always the same kind of beat, but it's... Yeah. Um, I just remember, want to see something really scary? Gosh, I want to say there's... <laughs> There were like two big ones though. Like corn was one of them. And then it was like, uh, you know, it was like Led Zeppelin or something like that. Like for the other one, there's been a couple iterations of it where it's been like, you know, these kind of like popular rock bands that have done it anyway, just a odd piece of trivia there. Um, fun trivia is fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there's one point in, in the talk that was absolutely my favorite part of it though. There's um, so the idea is, to give the audience the perspective of AR is going to be creepy. Augmented reality is going to be creepy. And, mm -hmm. you know, the human condition is, you know, that we do creepy stuff with our technology. Uh, and one of the Twilight Zone episodes, uh, I remember this, uh, this guy is, um, he's a criminal, or at least, you know, he's been convicted of a of criminal activity. So they exile him to like a moon of some planet somewhere. Right. So he's, yeah. he's like basically living on a rock in space and he's got like a, a uh, what do you call it? Like a, not a parole officer, but like a warden or whatever that visits him. Yeah. And uh, you know, he comes in his little spaceship and he, he, you know, the guy's wrongly convicted, I guess is uh, this, this, person's perspective of him so he feels bad you know this guy's been exiled to this rock in space so he brings him this female android to be his companion while he's there and then uh yeah. you know at the end of the episode they they uh exonerate him of whatever his cr crime was and the the warden comes in his little spaceship and he's like all right you're you know you're free to go let's bring you back to earth and he's like but here's the catch there's only one seat. You know, we can't bring your Android companion back. <laughs> so the show ends with the, the guy smashing his robot companion, which looks humanoid, by the way, it's, you know, it's yeah, a yeah. very realistic human looking Android. So, you know, the, the message was like, he doesn't want to leave this, even though it's not living, he doesn't want it to experience this isolation that he's felt you know, for as long as he's been there exiled to this planet, he'd rather smash it than have it, you know, risk it feeling alone. Uh, so I'm, I'm showing the slides for this. And I'm going through kind of the spiel for the episode. And I was like, or maybe he just didn't want people to know his search history. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great gag. <laughs> What's delightful about that is the contrast because it's actually a really dark story. It is. I mean, I mean there's a reason they call the show Black Mirror, you know, you know, mm -hmm. which is really the Twilight Zone 2020. Um, it kind of but updates then, the humor. Too, like, but then to yeah. like twist it and throw the humor <laughs> on the end of it. That's 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 fantastic. Ed. That is really yeah. good. <laughs> That was always fun. To, like that was one of my favorite parts. Is at the very beginning too. You're you're you've got people where they're like, you know, everybody comes in. They kind of sit and they're like, there's there's generally like competing things that they want to go see, right? And you'll have people leave at the beginning of your talks. It's not yeah. you know, it's, it's not. Normal. I don't find it insulting or anything like that. It's just like they thought it was going to be about something and it's not. Or you know, maybe they just didn't get drawn in. And it was like this is the part where I've got to like hook the people to where they don't leave. And, uh, you know, I go, I'm going on in this really dark path and you got to kind of bring it back a little bit. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, um, I think Marvel does this really well with their movies, uh, where DC doesn't, um, who I just, I just stirred up some controversy there. Didn't I? Them's fine words, uh, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. People are either tuning in or out of the show now. Um, unsubscribe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marvel's done a great job at this, especially with like some of the newer directors. I think like uh, I, I can never pronounce his name right. Uh, is it Takita with Kitty? What what the heck's that guy's name? He's from New Zealand, uh, oh, but know. I'll take your word. He, for it. Uh, yeah, he he's the guy that directed um, the Guardians of the Galaxy and yeah. uh, 
the Thor movies, the newer Thor movies. So like he took over like after like there was two Thor movies and then he's the one that came in and pulled the nose up on it and did, which is like my favorite Marvel movie of all time, Thor yeah. Ragnarok. So it's it like, very entertaining. yeah, they follow that same principle though. They, you know, they might go dark, but then they have like the right time to throw in some humor to just yeah. lighten the mood a little bit. So it doesn't, you know, you're not just cringing the, for two hours while you watch this thing. So that was, that was kind of my thought process. Like I gotta, I gotta find somewhere to lighten yeah. the mood here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when I die, what, delete my yeah. browser history. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, if you, you picture this guy being on a, on a rock in space and he's basically got a life like Alexa, which it's probably going to come on and start recording me now, but, yeah. uh, you know, he's got this, uh, you know, this Siri thing, uh, you know, but it's, it's a humanoid and that he's yeah. smashing it at the end. Like that, that clicked in my, I was like, maybe there's something you just didn't want us to know about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, way off topic, but it is a great like it's one of those things that's timeless. That's why I think I like it so much. The show. Yeah, it's like you can go back and like watch it now. And not only is it still entertaining and interesting, it um, you'll see that it's like the basis for like a lot of TV shows and movies that happened in the last, you know, 50 years. <laughs> it's like everything old is new again. Uh, you'll you'll be like this episode reminds me a lot of a movie or you know a lot of a TV series that I watched. I think you know people got. I, I wonder if uh, shows. I mean, I don't, I don't have a background in like movie or writing or theater or anything like that. But um, I wonder if the appeal of what these really are, are tragedies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as opposed to comedies and dramas, I, I think they they become tragedies because there's a tragic decision they have to make. Or just a weird fate. Like there's the one Twilight Zone episode where uh, this guy is constantly bothered by everyone. And finally, like for some reason, everyone dies or something like that. He's the last man on earth. And all he wants to do is just read and be left alone. And uh, it finally happens. He can read and be left alone. And then his glasses break. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's really kind of, it's a tragedy, right? You know, that's literally like the story arc of a tragedy. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, says the, you know, the armchair, whatever. Um, and so I think that might be part of the draw, draw to those. Uh, yeah. And, but you have to punctuate those for them to really be like, like if you're going to build a talk around something that's kind of dark like that, you need to, you need to punctuate it with humor uh, to make it, which is what you're saying Marvel is doing. And so it, it sort of has, has a tragedy punctuated by comedies, uh, which I, I guess that's the definition of a dark comedy. <laughs> So true. Uh, yeah. Probably my favorite movie of all time is falls into that category as a uh, Dr. Strangelove uh, or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb, which is, I think it was like St one of Stanley Kubrick's. I don't think it was his, was his, his first movie. It was an early movie that he did. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it's, I'm not going to ruin it for those who haven't watched it, but it's a delightfully uh, dark movie. Um, that's absurd and funny and, is it's filmed like it's serious, but it's a comedy. And yeah. It's delightful. No, I, you didn't go to Star Trek this year, right? I did not. Um, yeah. Did you, which is a shame see... because it's like two miles from my house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you happen to see the new Dr. Strange though? I have not had a chance to see it yet. Oh, uh, I'll okay. probably watch it on an airplane. <laughs> oh, ouch. <laughs> That hurts my heart a little, even though that's where I saw Thor Ragnarok the first time and, and still yeah. enjoyed it. So um, this one is a, a yet another director. And uh, this one is um, lacking the humor a bit. So there, yeah. there's a funny part here and there, but not nearly enough to kind of pull it out of the darkness. But it's still a very excellent movie. It's a very different kind of movie, though. Um it's very uh, people say it's it's kind of like a horror movie and i, I can kind of yeah. get where that comes from so you have to check that one out uh, oh i will it's just a matter of finding the time to do it yeah uh, and airplanes yeah. are good places actually to to do that uh, well i mean you've got a trip to poland you said yeah uh -huh. i've actually got should several, be exciting 
European conferences this year. So I'm going to oh, have nice. uh, this fall. I'll have plenty of uh, time to kill on a plane. So, <laughs> so uh, when, when we get a little rundown of uh, places you'll be and places to find you. Okay. Well, let me, uh, let me, uh, let me, let me look. <laughs> I'm put you on the like spot that. right now. Yeah, uh, so um, we, we've got uh, Poland, which I've never been to Poland. That sounds I haven't sounds either. Very uh, interesting. I'd I love to go there and check it out. Should be fun. Uh, as I'm bringing up my calendar here, so I can see what I've got. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'll be speaking at DevOps Poland, uh, but uh, between June 22nd and 24th in uh, in Krakow, which I am told by my boss, who speaks Polish, that it's Krakow. Uh, is how you're actually supposed to pronounce it. So hopefully I did that right, if anyone is Polish in the audience. Um, in July, uh, no, nothing. Actually, my, my calendar is empty. I'll probably be at JavaScript and Friends because it's local. Mm -hmm. and it's a little one-day event. Uh, I may just drop in and crash it and say hi to folks. So um, In August, I'm going to be at KCDC and Code Palooza, which is the week of the 8th and the week of the 15th. Uh, and I think you're, you're at code Palooza, but you're not at KCDC, but Sean will be. So we'll see Sean there. Yep. And, uh, in September, um, I'm going to be at the end of September. I'm going to be in Oslo at NDC Oslo. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, talking about dungeons, dragons, and graph databases. Uh, and I got accepted by uh, Techarama Netherlands, uh, which, oh wait, I wasn't supposed to announce that. Yet. <laughs> 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 uh, could you edit that out? <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's it's only uh, live. I, I, hypothetically, I've submitted to Techarama in other ones, but I haven't heard from them yet. You, you have know? a good feeling. You have a good yeah, feeling. I, but I got a good feeling um, uh, that uh, I'll be making a, a, tr a trip to the Netherlands. Um, and um, uh, there's some others that are tentative. I haven't been accepted at yet. Um, but um, and somewhere I haven't accepted yet, but they've invited me because there's overlapping conferences in October and November. But this will all probably mm -hmm. get firmed up in a couple weeks. But I could be going to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I could be going to um, um, I could be going to Lithuania. Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> so that could be fun. Um, uh. <laughs> or sure, saving throw failed. I, I got a four, yeah. Roy. I got a four. <laughs> we tried. Uh, Right. I, I even had advantage on that check and I still rolled double, uh, you know, <laughs> double one. So yeah. um, how about, how about uh, blogs, Twitters, any, any place else we can find you guy? Uh, so the, the, the God's honest truth is, is if you just type my name into Google, you'll find me because no one else has my name. Uh, if you want to uh, check out my blog that I haven't updated in about two years, uh, it's at guy.dev. Um, and uh, uh, I'm Guy Royce on Twitter. Um and Guy Royce on Twitch and stuff. Uh, lately, and I've been streaming on Fridays at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time uh, on uh, twitch.tv slash Guy Royce and twitch.tv slash Redis Inc. And I've been... And that's spelled R-O-Y-S-E, by the way. Yeah, yeah, R -O, uh, yeah. Romeo, Oscar, Yankee, Sierra, Echo. Uh, for all those uh, radio fans out there. <laughs> um, and... Uh, so I've, I've been uh, lately, I've been doing the uh, software defined radio stuff because I need to get all my code working for my talk. And so that's what I've been doing on stream. Um, Going to be doing another topic. Haven't decided what yet, but thinking about um, maybe doing a, uh, some graph database stuff with Redis, uh, where uh, I take a GraphQL interface with like Apollo GraphQL and then have that talk to my object graph and then have the object graph be backed by a graph database. And so just, I want to see what code patterns happen when I do this, because I've never done this before. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that'll turn into a talk, uh, you know, graph, graph, and graph attorneys at law or something. Um, <laughs> so I got a big graph of all the law cases or something. I don't know. Um, Half-baked idea. Um, I might, something I kind of really want to do, but I don't think I'll do this because this is, again, this is an old person thing, is... Um, did you ever spend any time on the uh, the dial-up BBS scenes back in the day? See, you, you did it again. You're trying to date me, and I want to say no, but the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to run a bulletin board, and I've always wanted to write my own bulletin board software, and I thought it would be fun to create like a, a, a SSHable BBS mm -hmm. uh, backed by Redis. I thought that'd be kind of neat uh, to do on stream. Uh, the problem is, is I, so much of the audience isn't going to know what the hell that is. 
And so it, it doesn't yeah. make it's like it's it'd be like doing a talk that was themed around the Twilight Zone. It's just not. Gonna I was going to say there's a Venn diagram. <laughs> there's a Venn diagram of uh, yeah. Twilight Zone and uh, BBSs yeah. that probably has a lot of overlap. Yeah. And so uh, <laughs> someone's asking which BBS uh, I ran Gateway BBS in Columbus, Ohio, uh, back in the day. So I remember um, a, a game called Legend of the Red Dragon. Do you remember? Oh, that? yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, used I to play that. that where you'd like log into a BBS and it was a, what like a uh, MMO that you you had to like text base, I guess. MMO is what yeah. they call it, right? Yeah. yeah, I remember writing a plug in for that, like to have like a side adventure or whatever side quest, whatever they're called. I always like playing Trade Wars. Uh, that was the thing that always uh, excited me. I spent a lot of time playing Trade Wars. Um, but yeah, it was it's good times. And part of me <clears> wants to sort of recreate that. Uh, another thing I'm thinking about is using Redis Graph as a backend for a multi-user dungeon, uh, so a, a text-based MUD, which I think is, might be a little more relatable. I've played around with that in the past on stream, but uh, I'd, I'd like to revisit it. Um, so I think that would be fun too. Um, <laughs> well, that's too funny. <laughs> uh, um, so Aztec Consulting, uh, you're in, in, in Grove City. And um, yeah, I, I actually ran it out of Reynoldsburg at the time when I was in college. It ran from like 1991 to like 94. So uh, yeah, we probably know each other. I was Spork uh, on the BBS. So uh, if if that's of any help, Spork was my username. We've got uh, a comment out of context here. I've been on my, my stream, not my podcast. I've been trying to get Mac working with Pretty much anything. That's just the OS in general hasn't wanted to work for me, but I've been trying to get it to work with .NET. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I've never been a fan of Apple. If you've ever heard me talk, you probably know this. Like, I'm not a big fan of their kind of like ecosystem lock-in and stuff. But then I, yeah. I bought a device and I'm like, you know, I'll give it a fair shake. And it has, it, I feel like it's a, like you, you've had animals, I'm sure. They yeah. can sense like fear and angst. Um, <laughs> I, I think the, the the Mac mini has some kind of sense that it's picking up that I don't like it. So it's throwing absolute fits and I've had to, I've had to wipe the OS twice now. Um, so I, when I got it, it was on whatever the OS was then, which is not an old device, but they come out with uh, what's the, the latest uh, Monterey, I think it's named after yeah, a cheese Monterey. or something. <laughs> uh, it, it, the next one's going to be uh, yeah, Mac OS Kojak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think they're named after cheeses. Um, uh, that, that's probably accurate, right? I think I'm on on something <laughs> onto something there. But you know, I did the and <laughs> I, I will talk fair. There. Yeah, I, I'm going to be fair here and say the same thing happened on Windows. Uh, when you go from one like major OS to another like just upgrade, not like reinstall, something always yeah. goes wrong. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I got it. I finally had some code working on it. And then I, I upgraded the OS and then I rebooted and it wouldn't restart. So I'm sitting, you know, at the login screen with a status bar that never moved past 2%. And uh, that happened. So I had to reinstall the OS twice. And uh, just in general, like, this this is not like a daily machine I touch. I touch it maybe once a week just to work yeah. on, you know, some experimental stuff. And it seems like every time I log into that thing, some setting that hasn't changed needs to be reset for some reason. It's like I'm trying to VNC into it right before the show on Wednesday, and it's refusing all my connections. And it's like, I haven't touched it since the last time. I VNC'd into it and, you know, wrote two lines of code. Like I haven't changed the configuration. I haven't updated anything. I haven't done anything to this machine yet. It will not let me log into it. So uh, I spend like an hour that morning just turning the, the screen sharing feature off and back on again until it works. It's like there's no rhyme or reason to why this thing does what it does. It just hates me. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's like a cat, right? You know, they, uh, they, they just sit there and they look pretty. Uh, but then, uh, if you don't give them attention regularly, they'll go and crap in your bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This thing, it, it does not like me and I don't like it. 
Um, I, I've invited it to go swimming in my pool. That it, uh, if it wasn't a, if it wasn't a company sponsored item, it may have already gone for swim. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, that's where that comment came from. We got yeah, yeah, again, way off track. Vuel Snape was always there with the good comments. He's quite excited about my BBS idea. I see in, in the chat. So um, yeah, uh, but uh, I think he's uh, he's old like we are. So yeah. <laughs> like I so I wanted to say like what's a BBS, but everybody would have called me out on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, your beard's not quite as gray as mine, but um, it's getting there. Yeah. No, but I, I think we're roughly the same age. So <laughs> I, I actually just turned fifty this year, so I'm officially. Oh, you uh, got a couple of years on me, but yeah, not, it, not, I, not enough. Uh, it's it's one of those things where once you hit fifty, it's like, like when you're in your forties, you're like, oh, this is pretty good. This is pretty good. You, you, you're kind of like on a plateau. And once you hit fifty, you realize now oh, there's the edge of the plateau. <laughs> <laughs> just, plateau goes up, right? Not yeah, down. Yeah. Please you're, tell me it goes it's up. All, it's, kind of sobering honestly um uh, you, you find yourself uh thinking in terms of what do you want to do it, mm -hmm. it, it's it actually is clarifying it's like okay what do i want to focus on um yeah so i i think it's actually um overall positive what's what's nice at least from my perspective is you're traveling you're you're going to other countries seeing other places um you know you're getting to do that type of stuff before it's uh you know Hopefully it's some time before it's difficult to travel, but it's something that, you know, you start thinking about when you get to a certain age, like uh, th these trips become a little bit more grueling to sit for hours in an airplane and, and yeah. that sort of stuff. So it's, it's nice that you're getting to do that. Um, not I, not actually, everyone gets to do that. I've, I've had the privilege of, uh, and, and I, I may do this again. Um, uh, I spoke at L in London a few years ago. I've spoken in London several times, but a few years ago when I spoke in London once, um, I got to take my mom with me, which was fun. Uh, and oh, so yeah. She's, uh, you know, if I were to happen to be going to the Netherlands, which may or may not be happening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> former deny. Uh, 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 she's interested in coming with me there as well. So that'll be kind of fun. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. So it's it's nice to be able to give my mom some of these experiences like she, she got to spend a week in London and she just never dreamed in a million years that she would ever get to e even leave the country. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't think she's even been to Canada, uh, which when it comes to international travel for an American citizen, mm -hmm. isn't really all that um, adventurous. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. Sorry to hear that. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> sorry. We shouldn't pick on Canadians. They're awesome. I, I, like, I, like, I like Canada a lot. And, um, but but yeah, I mean, she hadn't even been there. So, um, so it was exciting. And so she might be coming with me to, uh, the Netherlands, which will also be fun. Awesome. Well, it's, uh, it's been great talking to you guy. I could probably yeah. do this for another hour, but, uh, you know, we, we need to, we need to stay within the realms of a podcast. So I'm going to have to let you go, uh, but it's been fantastic talking with you. Yeah. It's been great talking to, with you too. It's been uh, a few months, I think. So it's been nice. Yeah. It's been too long. We should do something uh, on stream together that's code related at some point. Maybe I could yeah. help you with .NET Core on Mac <laughs> with my Mac skills, not my .NET skills. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think just it hurts. It yeah. hurts so bad. A fuel sample uh, disagrees with the podcast, but, you know. Uh, yeah. Needs must when well, devil drives. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, we definitely will do some kind of streaming soon. Um, we get this, uh, at least my conference behind me. Um, I know you've got a lot coming up, but uh, I'll have some yeah. time. We'll, we'll schedule something. Um, maybe we could do some data visualizations or something like that with uh, yeah, some of the stuff you're working on. But uh, thanks again. And thanks, folks that are here on the live chat. Um, Aztec and, and Fuel, Snabble and Chris and... Sean and all the good folks that, that came in to, to chat with us. Thank you very much. And uh, we will see you all soon and we'll publish this on our uh, SoundCloud as well. And um, that shows up on a lot of podcast feeds too, like Apple iTunes and whatever else is out there. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Guy. Thanks a lot.